Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We had an amazing opening and now we are back. Welcome to this session. There are going to be a lot of fireworks here. If you know who are the people in the panel. Welcome to equity in ensemble and collaboration panel. Equity in ensemble and collaboration panel. It's a powerful articulation. We have been searching for this, practicing it, implementing it since the very beginning in 2012. It started earlier. How do we practice equity amongst us as we create ensemble, How as we create collaboration? As the program has always centered artists of color, women and LGBTQ artists, we found that as we came together across our communities, we still needed to develop a shared analysis, a language and understanding in order to collaborate equitably, support each other, to have an expansive sense of collective power. And in this search has not stopped, the church has continued and the politics of the present, when we talk about theater of relevance, the present day politics, it provokes us to search, or we are searching for what does it mean now to discuss equity and ensemble and collaboration. In India, there's a playwright called Badal Sarkar, one of my teachers, who really created a new nomenclature as he provoked us to shed theater that has come down to us by colonial powers and provoked us to think and search for our own vocabulary, which was always inside our soul. And he writes in one of his plays, Eva Mindrajit, that language at times can become senile. Words can become battered. Meanings of these words can become maimed. And we have experienced this. Equity, the word equity means different in different rooms, depends on who's curating the conference, who's curating the room. Who's holding? Who's the steward of the room? We have all walked into rooms where words are used like equity. We have walked into rooms where we talk about ensemble, but there is a patriarchal, hierarchical, Euro-American way of process. And yet we call it ensemble. We call it collaboration. 
when we collaborate with people who have more power and people who do not have visibly less. We call it collaboration. But the process, does it really keep up to those words? And now in 2020, what does, what do those words mean? Equity, collaboration, ensemble. It means something more, more than just the etymology. Anybody who walks on the street and knows and speaks English knows what the words etymologically mean. But what does it mean in our soul, in our lived experience, in our processes of working? It has different meaning. Words that are burst sometimes in, through the, in the politics of people of color are co-opted. The same words are used. They mean different things. So what does it mean now? And with that search in place, we have invited a very, very strong, a group of strong thinkers for whom these words are not new. They have lived these experiences. They have architect, architected the words, the meaning of these words in their practice. And if there have been fractures, they faced it, they met with it. They tried to stitch it together and they move forward, inspiring the next generation. I will leave the discussion, you're on to something really powerful, something really sacred. Equity in ensemble and collaboration, that's the panel. And now it's my privilege and a genuine honor to introduce the facilitator and my dear, dear, dear friend, my elder, my guide, a person who has taught me so many things, to strategically think, to be in the center of fire and not get burnt, but always glow, to come into the room with grace, to hold tensions and fissures with compassion and love. Linda Paris Bailey, the, who has been the artistic director of, of Carpet Back Theater for over 45 years. She was a founding member of Alternate Roots, a sacred, sacred pilgrimage place. And three, a proud graduate of Kamala Harris's alma mater, historically black college, the Harvard University. Linda, to me, walks, talks, sings revolution. Linda has been revolution and music. Linda is revolution and music. And Linda, as long as Linda is in our consciousness, Linda Paris Bailey is revolution and consciousness. It is my proud moment in my life to be in this moment and introduce to you Linda Paddles Bailey. Thank you so much, the bunker. I, you know, that's a lot to live up to. And I want you to know that um, you always set the groundwork for discussions that I participate in, in such a clear and, and honest and passionate way. And I wanna thank you for that. I wanna thank you and Mina and Andrea for inviting me. Um, you could have chosen many, many, many people. Uh, and I'm very proud to be uh, the moderator of this panel of wise women. Um, and, uh, and I do claim uh, the, the elder status. I have been taught to, uh, to claim that. Uh, and I am proud to have other elders uh, on the panel. Uh, I want to talk, and, and again, Dupanker, you set this up beautifully, um, about the uh, point of view of this panel. And I think the point of view comes not only uh, from our participation in the Institute over the years, but 
from our individual practices that we brought to um, the work and how they congealed into something that I think uh, informs each other's practice and um, many, many more people that have participated in the Institute. And one of the things that came up repeatedly was that at the Institute, people were able to bring their whole selves. And I think um, we, in my years with Carpetbag, and I am emeritus, I'm no longer the, the director of Carpetbag, but we used to call it being healed and whole. And I think that some of the um, practices that again were assembled on the wall in that room um, in 2012 um, informed, as you said, the uh, subsequent the subsequent institutes. And I think we have built an extraordinary bottle, body of knowledge that will be evident with the panelists that you will hear this evening. Uh, I also want to say that, you know, I looked at other, you know, material about panels on equity and whatnot. And, and for the most part, they're coming from uh, major institutions and talking about um, equity from the standpoint of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's going to help your marketing, it's going to, you know, uh, diversify your board, but we are talking from organizations that's, that have historically been the voice of people of color and uh, speak uh, from that voice unapologetically. So I want to introduce this idea of, um, and I do believe, Elena, it was you, uh, maybe it was uh, Nobuko, the horizontal floor. So our panel is going to be horizontal and I'm going to shut up in a few minutes and let the panel begin. But I also wanted to, to, to mention that um, each person brought to this uh, institute a wealth of knowledge. And what we're going to do is we're going to hear from that knowledge this evening. Um, you're probably wondering if I'm going to introduce the panel. Well, no. I'm not going to introduce the panel because I've asked the panel to introduce themselves. Um, and I asked them to introduce themselves with uh, what, what I will call the four Ps. I asked them about their people. I asked them about their place. And that, that means wherever they come from, their home place. I asked them about their point of view and I asked them about their practice. And I've asked them to introduce themselves with those four, um, those four P words in mind. So I'm going to go and, and I will call on you simply because we don't have a circle um, and ask you to unmute your mics. I invite you to do that. And can we start with you, Nobuko, in your self-introduction? <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Uh, Yvonne Gar, Andrea, for all of you uh, who've invited me to be part of this incredible circle of uh, artists, community artists, creators. It, it, I'm really honored and I feel so joyful to be here in your presence because you are um, the future. And um, I find myself now being sort of the oldest person in the room, which I'm not used to, but I'm going to claim it. Uh, so I am, a, but I'm a third generation Japanese American. Um, we call ourselves Sansei, third generation. I was born in Los Angeles. Um, I'm a mother of an Afro-Asian child who is, has given me four grandchildren. So I have a four Afro-Asian uh, Muslim uh, grandchildren, um, the oldest of whom are 23. Uh, and I, uh, I was a child of Japanese-American uh, relocation 
Um, and me and my family uh, were one of the 120,000 uh, Japanese Americans who were moved from the West Coast and moved into camps uh, during World War II. And this uh, forced removal was an experience that binds me with so many other people of color who've experienced forced removal in this country. Um, this experience of being so, of, of dislocated, unbelonging, uh, sort of a refugee in my own country, uh, made me feel that, um, and my family, to, to, to try to be someone who could be uh, accepted. So we really uh, shed a lot of who we were in order to try to be that way. So um, instead of being called Nobuko, I was called Joanne. Uh, my middle name was Joanne. And most of my life in the early, until I was 27, I lived with Joanne as my first name. And, um, and the same with, uh, when we wanted to be an artist, uh, the training that we received uh, was Western arts. Um, I, as a child, when I heard my uncle sing Japanese songs, I thought it was strange. And I couldn't understand my grandparents because I didn't speak Japanese. So um, I trained as a dancer and that became my voice and worked in, um, a business that the stories that I performed were were nothing like who I was. Um, I was on a stage with other mostly Asians because those stories called uh, and musicals called for Asians uh, or Orientals. And so I experienced um, being sort of the pawn of, of this uh, culture that told their own stories about us. And, and I felt frustrated by this. And in the 60s, I, uh, I sort of dropped out. And I started searching for a way to find my own voice and find a way of expressing myself that was, uh, that was really who I, who I am. And I got, and how I began that journey was really through the Black movement. And through the Black movement, um, I was introduced to the Asian American movement. And so in the early 70s, I, um, just stumbled into uh, singing, creating songs about who we were. And that feeling of singing for my own people, songs that were about us, awaken me to a whole other way of looking at art and what it could do. Uh, we were sort of troubadours who moved around the country to different Asian American places, talking about who we were, what was going on in the movement. We were sort of griots for, for, for the movement. And when I decided to sort of settle down into my community, because for the long run, I, I, I knew that I had to be seated in a community. I went back to Los Angeles and I was lucky enough to um, be taken to this Buddhist temple in South Central. And, and so in this Buddhist temple, I was allowed to teach dance, a modern dance, and uh, be in a, in a place that had, that the Reverend, um, Reverend Kodani, who believed that art was a way to learn about Buddhism. But in this temple, I learned what it was to be Japanese, what it would learn. I learned what it was to be Japanese American. I learned to reclaim Nobuko and um, create work, music, dance, theater, bring people in those spaces uh, to work on, 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 in a temple that had been a refuge for Japanese Americans after World War II. So there were stories in this in this church, in the in the social hall where we rehearsed, where we where we sweat and we when, and we danced, and we so 
I feel like that was the put me in a, it put a root for me. And I was able to bring people into this space, other artists, people who are, and people who are non-artists. Most of the dancers I used, I trained, and um, artists that we came together were, we learned together. And we learned to tell our own stories. So out of that, I, in 1970, uh, in the, uh, 1975, we started Great Leap. And it became formally a nonprofit arts organization in 1978. So it's been about 40 years. Uh, but I've been doing this work for almost 50 years, uh, learning and, and, and by doing, learning by doing. So, um, and when I came here to this institute, I found others who were like myself, who, and I didn't have a name for this device theater. I didn't have a name for a lot of what I did. Uh, I, and uh, so it's been a place like a homecoming for me to come here and to be fed by others who, who have many more experiences than I have. And so I'm grateful to be here with you. And um, I'm here to learn and remember and, and, and be in your embrace and you be in mine. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Nobuko. And in, in the spirit of, of equity, I'm going to, um, if you see my phone <laughs> as, you're, as you're talking, okay. um, mm -hmm. and everything that you say is wonderful, but I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to have a, um, a, as much time as they need, but in relationship to others. So I'm going to start timing us so that we can stay on track. And I'm going to invite Sharon to unmute. And um, if you would share your three P, four Ps actually uh, with the panel. Thank you okay. so much, Nobuko. My roomie, my roomie. Um, well, good evening. Um, uh, my name is Sharon Day, and um, um, I come from the people of the Strong Woods, uh, which is a boys' fort reservation just south of um, International Falls. Um, born and raised in Minnesota, and um, um, you know, our people have always been storytellers. And, um, you know, I grew up listening to um, people tell stories, grew up listening to my dad. Um, my father composed hundreds of songs and, um, and music was always a part of our life um, through both traditional music and contemporary music. And, um, and, um, uh, and that was just sort of what we did. And it wasn't until I was about 40 years old, um, I became um, the director, maybe I was 36, the director of the Indigenous Peoples Task Force, although at that time it was the Minnesota American Indian AIDS Task Force. And, um, and um, in those days, uh, 1987, 1988, um, 1989, people were dying uh, from, uh, from AIDS. And I wanted to do something to keep um, our young people alive. And so I, um, I started a theater company um, within our organization. It was a youth theater ensemble to teach other youth about HIV. So that storytelling, um, it, was, um, it was so necessary to keep us alive. And, um, and so I, who I learned, um, uh, you know, I, I never took an art class in my life, never took a theater class in my life. Um, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, except that I knew that it was an important thing to do. And so I called uh, Muriel Miguel from Spider Woman Theater, and she came and worked with us and um, her and her sisters, and they helped create, uh, help, helped us. Um, and then they came back six months later and, uh, and Muriel said, Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> and I said, um, Muriel, they're just kids. And she said, do you want me to lie to them? Do you want me to tell them they're good when they're not? And so then she stayed for another six weeks and um, instructed us some more. 
And, uh, and we took the stories from the youth, um, people living with HIV, um, our elders. And, um, and out of that, she created a play called My Grandmother's Love. And, um, and when, uh, when Muriel went back to New York City, uh, we worked with Phyllis Jane Rose from At the Foot of the Mountain Theater, which was the first um, feminist theater in the country. And uh, we worked with her and we continued. And so that was 30 years ago. Um, we're still working, we're still learning. Um, being part of the Institute, we've learned so many. Um, you know, we've learned from everybody else's practices and we've taken what's useful to us and incorporated into what we do. And um, most of you know, my grandson uh, Kirby is the um, director of the youth, uh, the Kedwin Youth Theater Ensemble. And um, he's been mentored by DePonker for about five years. And so um, I'm really proud of him and the work that we continue to do. We produce probably about um, 13 plays over the years and um, have incorporated, you know, music and dance and a lot of poetry into our work. And so that's who I am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Carol, um, how about you go next? And Elena, I'm gonna save you for last. Sure. Um, well, this is amazing. Um, and I've been, I had to spend some time, gotten to spend some time over the past couple of years that I've been at the Institute with both Sharon and Nobuko and to hear these stories just reminds me so much how much I really, that place, the spirit of being at the Institute is so healing um, and, and welcoming and open um, and a place of deep, deep learning. I was born and raised in New York City and uh, <laughs> went to the high school performing arts where coming out of PA, I thought, oh, I knew theater. <laughs> and um, it wasn't until the 1970s and I was studying directing at Hunter College and Lloyd Richards was my directing teacher. And he gave me the great gift of honesty and said to me, you're an okay actor, mm -hmm, but you're a much better director. <laughs> and I said, I want you to get out and start directing. And so here I am in New York City um, in the 1970s, and my husband and I were members of the New York chapter of Jimmy and Grace Lee Boggs' organization, a national organization for an American revolution and part of the New York chapter. And I found myself running from New Federal Theater where I was directing a play with at New Federal Theater back to Queens to evening meetings and study groups and on the weekends going out and organizing. Um, and I did that for almost four years. And that experience of being with Noor, with Jimmy and Grace's um, absolutely uh, incredible ability to, have to really force you to think critically um, and develop those critical thinking skills through looking at systems and structures. Um, I didn't know it at the time, really formed the foundation of everything that I did in theater. Um, I was forged in the Black Arts Movement. Um, my work in the Bay Area with uh, Oakland Ensemble Theater and Lorraine Hansberry Theater were absolutely essential to the work, to my, um, to my career. Um, I'd never imagined the career that I ended up having. If you had told me back then that <laughs> I would have ended up with the National Endowment for the Arts, I would have said, yeah, right, um, sure. Um, but this, the, the twin, uh, uh, the twin parts of my need of, of, of creativity and directing and theater and what it could do for communities and what I knew about organizing and systems and structure meant that when I was at the NEA, I understood what needed to be done to try to begin to dismantle the systems that were held in place at the theater program that prevented um, equity from being um, what I consider equity from being a part of how the funding was done. Um, this afternoon, I was talking with a former colleague from those days and he said, Carol, I just want to acknowledge that you began to dismantle racism in the theater program. 
and I thought it was unnoticed. Um, and I was really, really moved that he that he understood and paid attention because I paid a price for it. Um, yet that didn't stop me. Um, the the I think the ca two capstones to how I see equity playing out in two very different ways. One was the the, uh, the time that I spent at with August Wilson at the National Black Theater Summit on Golden Pond and helping to organize that and then working with his organization for five years, the African Grove Institute for the Arts. And when August asked me if I would be interested in working on that event, and I said to him, August, um, I, you know, you, 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 you're the dude, you're the man. However, I'm only interested in doing this summit if we're going to try to build something from it that will support Black theater. That was paramount for me. And we got to begin to do that and then August passed. Um, and what in, the, in that meantime, what happened is that the funding community, um, their commitment was to August wasn't to the African Grove Institute for the Arts. We hadn't had enough time to really make that connection. Um, but as we were going through that experience, and this is the thing that I wanna say, it's been a, um, a, a piece that, that stuck with me all my life. Um, you can't fight and beg the same man. And this was the piece that, that we talked about many times at Agia. How do we make this organization be able to financially um, have the support and the resources that it needs to support Black theater makers and Black, and black theater? And what does it mean to be in community with other organizations? Because we, it wasn't just Agia working alone, we were working with BTN, et cetera. Um, but I came away from that experience knowing that there was still a missing piece in this work. And I found it both at Alternate Roots and I found it definitely, clearly at um, the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation. And it was this, this place coming into a place where you have all these people from all these different backgrounds and aesthetics and languages and styles and, um, and walking into a room where you see that in action was like mind blowing for me. I was almost in tears the first time because it, I had not seen that level, that, that um, breadth, depth and scope of artists working in community who embraced each other in the ways that I saw at both roots and then it at um, NIDIC. Um, it, it, though, that's the cap, that's, yeah. So I just, I have to put that out there. Um, and did I exceed my three minutes, Linda Paris Bailey? Um, I do believe you did, um, um, but you know what? This is just a framework, but I do want to make sure that, that uh, we hear from Adelina. Thank you. And you will get to continue to speak about that, uh, Carol as we talk about grounding. So, um, man, I'm, I'm like, wait, don't, don't, don't let all the jewels out at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna Even go wanting on. more, okay. <laughs> so, Adelina. Hi, Linda. Um, Hi. I just, <laughs> I wanna start off by saying uh, such a deep gratitude and thanks to uh, Dipan, Carmina, Andrea, and all the folks all, as well for the invitation to be here. Um, I think it's clear from the panel that I'm here because um, I'm 358 years old in old soul time. Mm -hmm. So Nobuko, I think I, I'm just gonna take elderhood at this point, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm also going to very much own uh, being the young one here, pseudo young, and uh, being in such awe of uh, who I get to sit with. And um, for me, this is emblematic of what happens at NIDIC, that it was the first space where I not only had peers, but I had teachers. Um, and I'll speak to that um, after acknowledging that uh, I am uh, broadcasting from Tongva lands, um, that I was born and raised in uh, the original Payaya lands of the indigenous peoples, and that means San Antonio, Texas, um, and that I have um, 
been carrying um, coyote trickster medicine because of my mother for many years. So a lot of people know me as a coyote on stage, uh, but that was a process as well um, and a development. My, my, so those are my places. Um, and I hold on to coyote only because I am a traveler and I try to be as um, coyote, sneaky, quiet, responsible respectful um, as I'm entering different places and um, acknowledge that as a, as a two-spirit Chicana, uh, lesbian feminist, uh, among other markers, um, my peoples have been in diaspora, uh, my peoples have been um, separated and sold um, over and over again um, in Texas. And um, that being said, uh, you know, I, I was shaped by a Mexican-American childhood and I was shaped by Spanglish. Um, neither English or Spanish was my first language. It was Spanglish. So I went to places like the Washeteria. Um, I went and I learned to drive and it was parquear my car. Um, and this was, was the, the language of both uh, poetry and politics for me. So my people's tend to be um, Chicanx, Cutie Pac, other uh, progressive communities of color. Um, I put that word progressive there because I have learned over and over again that a person of color isn't necessarily my ally. And um, I think that at NIDIC, that practice that we're gonna speak to about equity has been important. Um, and I have been, shaped by uh, incredible artists and, and people. So my, my practice as a teatrista, first and foremost, started in my childhood living room with my mother. Uh, I'm the eldest of eight. Uh, I'm post-welfare, but sometimes as, as an artist, I get really close to <laughs> economically to that feeling. So uh, I, I, I have learned how to um, walk and recreate ideas of success in American theater by uh, recognizing that I am not in conversation with white Euro Western theater, although I have had um, opportunity and access. Um, and part of that access that I have uh, spoken to when I talk about coming up through uh, undergraduate or grad school, especially undergrad, um, where I got incredible training as an actor and, and as a director, but I recognize coming up in the 90s uh, during the whole conversation, especially in Dallas, Texas at that time of multiculturalism, that I had that light skin privilege that allowed me to uh, play roles um, that were lead roles. And I point to that because there are plenty of people of color with darker skin who at that time weren't being cast in those roles. They were the background uh, actors or maybe a supporting role. So that has influenced my point of view and my teaching, like many of the panelists here, I have um, always been involved in training and providing tools to other artists. I feel that teaching in the community has been um, my practice since I was 21. Um, so almost 30 years of working with communities that don't have institutional access. Um, and recognizing the, the beauty and the tools that we do have um, that the institutes usually beat out of us one way or another. Uh, and I have been, um, you know, I've been out before it was fashionable. And I think it's important to speak to that because I, I do know that for a lot of cutie pock and two spirit um, LGBTQ folks, there, it's a given that um, you can be out and accepted even in the theater world. That was not the case when I was out. I was very fortunate to have um, the example of Sheriel Moraga, the only Chicana lesbian playwright that was out at the time. And so for me, that lineage to Chicano theater, and I do use the O purposely, I had that intervention of her life and her example right before. So I attach myself to that feminist, um, Chicana indigenous lineage. And then I had um, Cora Cardona in Dallas, 
um, who taught me Mexican avant-garde theater. And, um, and then I had a chance to work with Cherie and Celia. So I named my teachers because I think that's important. I'm gonna stop there because I wanna be under three minutes. I wanna make Linda happy and smile. And so I'm gonna give it back to Linda. Thank you so much, Adelina. Um, and, and, you know, time, again, is only an issue in terms of equity. And, uh, you know, we all went over, by the way. So don't, don't concern. Um, but I think it also is evidence of our, our practice. You have to know someone's story. Um, you have to, if we are going to create this, this, this circle, uh, this horizontal floor, this, um, we have to know each other's stories. So this is an example of practice in, in our equitable circles. And uh, just, you know, the other uh, practice that we have is that everybody participates. So in order to be brief, I prepared mine and I'm just gonna share this with you now. And then we'll get to the first question, which is like, what is this equity we're talking about? What, how does it show up? And we're going to have uh, Sharon and Carol speak to that um, right after this. So people, I am a descendant of enslaved Africans. I'm a black woman. I'm an Afro-Latin raised in the North with Bajan roots. My father took me to West Indian dances and my grandmother took me to the Shinnecock powwows. My pronouns are she and her and my people are all those who have been disempowered by power, impacted by genocide, slavery, and colonialism. I live in Knoxville, Tennessee at the foothills of the Southern Mountains, land of the Cherokee and other indigenous peoples. My home place is anywhere where there is common ground and purpose. My point of view, my point of view is the long haul, that life is a spiral ever widening towards justice, but doomed to pass through the same points until the spiral can encompass all of us. My practice is rooted in ensemble with principles of shared cultural work and a responsibility to reveal multiple truths. I share the diverse stories of my African diaspora. I directed the Carpetback Theater for 45 years and I'm now a solo playwright. So that's me. Drop the mic. That's how you do it under three minutes, people. <laughs> so let's get down to it, y'all. Um, what are we talking about? And I'm going to ask that um, we have uh, Sharon and uh, Carol, maybe we can uh, put them both on screen. I don't know if that's possible, but um, this is gonna be a conversation. And I will say that this was out of last night's um, pre-conference talk. And there was uh, a description and there was a description and then there was pushback and then there was um, a lively conversation. So um, Carol and Sharon, would you, I invite you to open your mics. I don't um, even remember what we said now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there are hopes, but um, basically what we're looking for is, is, you know, being grounded in a definition uh, with this, all of this information as background. And um, you said some, she said some pretty powerful things and Sharon said some pretty powerful things. And I can, I can, you know, I can put, pull up the, the little notes and, and, and basically we, we talked about what kind of uh, a space we wanted to have and based on the experience of the in Institute and uh, Sharon made some comments about pie. And um, I think that that is the, the core of our conversation. And um, Sharon, would you like to start or Carol, would you like to start? Sure, I think, you know, and I think about equity, you know, what, what we talked about a little bit was that, you know, equity is such a little word, you know, for something that has to hold so much. And um, so for me, um, you know, when I think about uh, equity as, a, as an indigenous person, and you know, I think about sovereignty. And sovereignty to me is that I as an individual have the agency uh, to make relationships. And, um, and, and those relationships are not only with um, individuals, um, but 
but also, um, um, you know, with with the land, with the water, with the animals, and um, and and so that sovereignty, and that to me, that is part of um, what uh, we all need to have. And so, um, uh, equity is just such a small word, and you know, it's like these words that kind of get like buzzwords, like diversity, and uh, like. Like, I'm not going to be your diversity, you know? Like, if I go into a room and I'm the only um, person of color, then whoever's in that room, they need to figure that out so that I'm not the only one. So I'm not going to be the only one. And, um, and you know, lots of times equity, it's about talking about funding. But I think before we get to me, before we get to that whole funding thing, like we have to, um, and that was what was so so helpful about the Institute is learning these practices, you know, sharing our practices with each other and, um, and, and that each practice has value. Each practice has value. Our stories need to be told. And it's time that we tell our own stories. Um, so I think that's, I'll stop there and let Carol take it. Um, you know, I think this is really, um... This is, uh, thank you for, for prodding me and remember, uh, helping me remember that there are two kinds of equity that I think that I was talking about. There are many ways of having equity, um, of talking about equity. I think a part of the challenge that I have about this discussion in our field about equity is that we haven't talked about the inequity. Mm. We have, you know, we haven't, forget, haven't even defined or, or um, admitted the, the decades of inequity. I'm not just talking about funding. I'm talking about focus and talking about value, I'm talking about support, I'm talking about agency, I'm talking about authority, um, that, that, um, the, that uh, communities of color in, or in, the, in the theater field have been devalued, historically devalued. Um, so that, that there, is, there is that piece, you know, if we, if we wanted to get to a place of really equ of equity, and when I think of equity, it's um, uh, Think of it as some people have a house that they've had for 30 years, it's paid off and they've got a lot of equity in the home. Whereas somebody else had a hotel room <laughs> in, a, in a SRO, single room occupancy. And uh, they're, they're now saying that they're equal. No, it, the inequity that has happened in our field, on, it's the, the lack of funding just reflects the lack of people who think that what we do is worthy. When I think about cultural equity, um, it's the, I think Liz Lerman talks about hiking the horizontal, because right now in our field, in our country, we have a racialized hierarchy that shows up in every single sector. And it, it's white theater at the top and it's black and people of color at the bottom and some other folks in between. And it's, but I'm not trying to talk about going from this to this, but from this to this, it's that horizontal floor. Um, when we think about equity and cultural equity in the theater field, it's interesting to me that people will say that Sharon's work or Novico's work is culturally specific, but we don't say that Tennessee Williams or Mamet is also culturally specific. Culturally specific. It cannot be otherwise. And that's why I'm saying, so I agree with Sharon that when we talk about this word equity being um, too small, I think it's small because it's, it is, you can't um, address all of the things that have um, been impediments to people in communities of color to be able to realize their dreams, their ambitions, their hopes, their needs for their community uh, by just talking about the small little word equity and think that we're talking about equality or something that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to invite, um, I'm going to change up our pattern here, and I'm also going to invite Elena. Would you, I think I hi, do you want to weigh in on this equity? No. I would love to because um, yes to everything that has been said, and I want to, I want to come back to uh, the importance of the Institute and the practicality around the, the pragmatic effort that has been made 
uh, in Spanish, the word is entre nos, right? Between us, because to um, Sharon and Carol's point, there is the issue of equity uh, with our theaters of color and white mainstream. And I, and I think that what has been so marvelous about NIDEC is that initiative was taken to bring us together. Mm -hmm. And that there's also for me, what's very exciting about NIDEC is how we practice equity amongst ourselves, because I don't think it's one or the other. It is also um, this, this journey um, that I've experienced with NIDIC. I, I wasn't there at 2012. Um, at that time, um, I was actually uh, co-founding Aderisa Productions Company with my wife and our uh, spiritual elder. But for me, the, the synchronicity and congruity is that we were uh, founding a company where we were centering um, uh, Chicanx, queer people of color, women of color, and that we were clear that there'd be zero homophobia. So we were making our own kind of agreements. And then when I was invited in 2015, so I've been at NIDIC 2015, 27, 2019, popping in, it was the first time ever in my professional career that I saw other masterful artists of color mm -hmm. and that it began with uh, agreements, like what is a group agreement? So the creating of the space together, I wanna offer that to people who are not um, Institute uh, uh, fellows and who are, who are listening to us and saying, yeah, but how do you go about this? And um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there for Nobuko and others to jump in. But I think the fact that entering the space with other people and recognizing for myself that I didn't know the history of most of the artists in the room. And by that, I also mean cultural history precisely because in the US we are not taught each other's okay. histories. Yeah. So if we are not versed in each other's stories and histories, then we are strangers to each other and strangers tend to be fearful strangers tend to keep distance. And the difference here is that we made a commitment to get to know each other and to practice uh, that incredible indigenous tenet of reciprocity, which also means working through conflict. So I'll stop there, but... Um... Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for that grounding. And... Um... In terms of the Institute, and I think uh, Nobuko, I'm gonna switch it up a little and ask you to respond to a different question if you're, if you're ready. Uh, we talked about the, the, the practices and uh, before I ask this question, can, can we see the, the, the slide of the wall? Ah, see? There's Nobuko, so perfect timing. Um, behind Nobuko is the collective knowledge of the sessions from one institute. And that collective knowledge informed the next inf institute and the next. And that was one of the beauties of being able to produce this institute Thank you, Pangea. Thank you, Art to Action. Over time. And the collective knowledge that is gathered over time is what we are benefiting from in this conversation. And Nobuko, what I want to ask you is what, and you talked about this, what has been the ripple effect of the practices that we generated in the Institute, that we shared? that we gifted to one another? What, what's what been the ripple effect of that from your point of view? For me, um, the, the, the ripple effect or the effect was understanding that we are a field. We're not as, we're not on the sides, we're not on the edges. We are a field of work that is very uh, specific and powerful. I mean, we 
and and it, the depth of it of the depth of it because we we get to hear from people from Palestine and Venezuela etc as well as as in this country uh, we can hear native people and native hawaiians and native canadians and native uh you know uh, americans we see a perspective that we don't often get to see so it when you bring all of that in it expands your internal world first of all if you just live in los angeles and you just walk around and and you live in that little world that little big world that you you think it's big but then you come here and you realize how vast this work is and how powerful it is how it's working in so many different spaces and and different kinds of communities it, it really expands your whole concept of what you're doing in your own space you take that home with you and you know that behind you and around you is is this whole bigger idea uh, that is powerfully at work and constantly at work it's not just you alone that the ripple effect for me is that I have this whole, this whole body of people and this body of work underneath me and behind me and around me. So um, that's what it's been to be in the circle with you all in these years as they've gone on and the different people that have come in, in and out, the people that we've lost, the people that we've, we've, we've been able to move with We've been able to hear their stories. We've been able to, to move with them, doing their work with them so that we can actually feel the teaching. We can actually be in the teaching, not just hear it, not just uh, understand it intellectually, but to practice it together. Uh, it's a much different uh, situation than, um, so the circle, we, I wanna go back to this idea of what kind of space do we, do we make this is a circle this is horizontal this is a place that we bring our ancestors we bring our whole selves it's a safe space to be all of who we are and 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 that safe space is not a comfortable space necessarily yeah yeah that we have to prepare be prepared to be vulnerable to be humble to be assertive but to, to listen, really listen, and to really be willing to do the work with each other that we wouldn't, or that we don't feel comfortable with. And be, act silly, act, you know, make mistakes, and know that you're, 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 you're supported and will be caught, and you won't be falling on the floor, that, you, that your idea can be transformed into, when you, when you're falling, somebody transforms that into something where you are supported. That's what it's been, what I've observed and what I've experienced here in this space. And, and I would say that that's been my experience as well. But you also brought up um, some of the difficulties. Yes. And um, we don't wanna leave this discussion uh, without talking about some of the difficulties. And this, this question that I'm going to ask, I'm going to throw out to the entire panel so that um, anyone can start the discussion and start the speaking about it. So equity discussions in communities of color are complex. We must examine diverse cultural traditions, internal biases like colorism, privilege, political leanings, and even our own oppression Olympics. What have we learned in the Institute about managing these challenges? And what can we share with others about managing the internal challenges of working across culture? I'll start. Okay. Just to make you smile, Linda. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to start off by saying that the Institute has taught me first and foremost that I lose nothing when we 
all share in the practice of First Nations first, when we all then share in the practice of a shared analysis of what has happened to Black peoples, of what has happened to Asian peoples, what has happened to other I, I lose nothing and gain the entire world. And the only way for me to not participate in uh, oppression Olympics is to understand that my peoples have a specific context and historicity to um, different kinds of colonization imperialism and to be able to hold that history and open myself up to everyone who is in that Nidic space creates that collective strength of understanding that we may have similarities, um, but that the differences don't make me, um, my story less than. And it is that practice that I continue to carry also, this is a ripple effect as a director, um, I lose nothing by shining light on every collaborator in the room. And so I think if we can move away from the great white man, you know, ideas of there's a great director and there's this and that, and understand that it is always collective. We allow for uh, such a deepening, widening experience um, and, and that it happens because of the reciprocity and the other principle at the Institute, which asks permission, asks permission if you're going to use someone's technique or practice or story, name where you get your practice, name your teachers, name the stories, so that not only do we become um, witnesses to each other, we become each other's best advocates. And in this day and age, to go to the bunker's point, I am just moving forward, and, and I feel I've been doing this, but it's so clear to me that if I am not in collaboration supporting indigenous artists, black artists, trans artists, then I have no business being in that room. I think the urgency is upon us to continue the work, but to be very clear of where our energy is spent. And NIDIC for me affirms it over and over and over again. We are each other's mirrors. And sometimes that mirror has been cracked. And to be able to look at the beauty between the cracks, and to offer each other light through the cracks, that's how we're gonna save our humanity together. You made me smile. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I, I will interject and then I'll ask another question. I mean, we are in a period where half the people in the country uh, believe a liar, um, believe uh, in supporting things that, that um, do us harm. And one of our roles as artists, I think, and I'm going to say this and people are going to go, oh, cringe, um, is to be present and in front of those people who do not know us, do not appreciate the other 50% of the country. And I think we have an important role. And I think also that we have seen evidence of our power. Um, and uh, what, however one feels politically about voting and all of that, I think there is evidence of our power in that um, there's evidence in Georgia. <laughs> so um, these these things are so important and important for us as artists of color. And um, I just wanted to to interject that because I'm I feel that deeply. Can I just say one thing? Yes. Um, Sometimes I, I just want to refer back to this idea of the kind of the space, because some of us have worked in the spaces where we're having to be the multicultural person or the per diversity person. Uh, but and and there's a certain kind of a heads 
you have to have to work in that space. But this space is so different from that space. And sometimes we can get those things confused. In other words, we might be used to being out there fighting uh, for our voice, fighting for our place, fighting for, but in this space, it is a space that's, that listens, that wants to hear, that wants to support. And it's a very different attitude that you come into this space uh, with than you do in, an, in that other world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, the thing that comes up for me um, over the years of working in theater, and the number of times that artists coming, actors would come in, they bring their candles, they may bring some incense into their space to get themselves grounded before they went on stage. Nidic was the first time that I saw ritual and ceremony as an everyday part and practice of every single thing from morning, noon until night. I had never experienced that before, where the collective group came together each morning and um, and deep and taking breath deep breaths together with Dapankar and Nina with the two minutes of silence. Um, I mean, it's just the things that you know, working in circles. Um, I had never experienced that before. It was mind blowing. Um, and I remember, I think it was last year, um, a young white woman. I was coming into a workshop and she was leaving the room, and she was in tears. And she said she had never been asked about her ancestors before. And she didn't know how to act. I think it was Sharon Bridgeworth's um, workshop, um, and she was just overwhelmed because that 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 she it had never it was so far into her, and she was so moved by it. It helped open up something in her to help her under um, um, I think examine what happened in our country when people um, assimilated to this thing we call whiteness. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to offer that I think that the word equity is small. I also think our understanding of theater is smaller. And what is theater? Mm. Mm. And if we're, if we're not stuck at just thinking about theater, then, um, and we're thinking about cultural culture and practices and community, it opens up so wide, so deeply, um, the way that people need to hear these stories and how and who's telling their stories and sharing their stories with them. But I think theater is even a smaller word than equity as, as it's practiced in this country. Mm -hmm. I, think, I, I think that's true. I think that's true for like, um, to some extent, but I think, you know, just um, theater, um, uh, you know, just going back to the opening tonight when uh, Joy Harjo was saying, Theater is everything we do. Mm -hmm. Theater is everything. It's in our ceremonies. It's in our, you know, when that, when that, you know, when we go out there and we put that altar down on the floor and we put all of those things we're going to use, that, that indeed is theater, right? And it's how, like, even ceremonially, it's how you remember things. Um, you know, what gets placed where? How does it go? What is the water for? What is, you know, the, that, those are the things that keep us alive. And I think that's what I was trying to say before. And it's, you know, and as we look to the future, um, it really is every single one of us um, looking at what has kept us alive, mm. what has brought us to this place and how do we move forward with that in the, in, in, um, the values that our people have had that have moved us forward, that has kept us here? How do we share that with, with younger people? How do we keep um, moving alive? And I think about like, um, you know, um, I don't often identify myself as, as being um, a queer a lesbian, but I am. And I guess it's just a, so much a part of my life that I just figures, mm -hmm. you know, in, in that I've been so um, notorious that uh, everybody just knows that anyway. <laughs> but um, when I think about, you know, like being a Native American uh, lesbian, I think that, you know, we are the answer to um, uh, het heteropatriarchy, right? 
Like we are the antidote to that. Um, much as, um, you know, many uh, of our practices are the antidote to capitalism where only a few take so much because, you know, in our communities, you know, we're taught, you take care of the children, you take care of the elders, you take care of those most vulnerable. And, and those are the things that we need to bring forward um, if we're going to truly change. You know, there, there's gonna be vaccinations, there's sort of a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of COVID, um, but what, what kind of a society do we shape? And, you know, um, actors, poets, artists, you know, we've been at the forefront of every major change um, everywhere. And so we need to do that again now. And so I just urge everybody to, you know, like we need to bring our best, best, um, our best forward. And um, you know, that's what I do with our, our youth theater ensemble, uh, equip them with, um, a voice, uh, equip them with, um, you know, that sense of justice, um, and no matter where they go. And when we talk to our kids, you know, we say, you know, when Black lives matter, Native lives will matter. This is such a, an important and amazing conversation. I'm looking at the clock. And I'm, I know we're drawing um, to a close and I'm getting little notes and messages in the, in the chat. But I, I, want, I want the panel to respond as briefly as possible to the important question, which I think is, what are we called to do at this moment? What do we, as artists, as ensemble practitioners, as members of um, these diverse communities, what are we called to do now? Anybody can take it up, but you have to be quick. <laughs> well, I, I think we have a special uh, responsibility right now and, and the, the, the space is open for us to really step out and uh, just push our, our, let our ideas out now. I mean, let's make this a rich space for, for people to see who we are. Let's make this a, a, you know, a welcome space for people to see who we are. And for, for those around us, our brothers and sisters, I mean, we are the example. We know how to collaborate. We know how to cross boundaries. We know how to do that work. Do it now. I mean, this is the moment we need to show uh, how we do this work. Feel free. It doesn't matter if you have the money or not, do it. I'm working with uh, Lula Washington's daughter and her uh, and Johanna, another African group uh, on a piece called Eight Minutes, 46 Seconds. I mean, just do the work. We don't have any money. We're just doing it. We're getting together. We're doing the music. We're, you know, uh, we're using our culture. We're using Ring Shout. We're, we're using Obon, you know, uh, so use, use what you are, use all of it, cross that boundary, show how, how diversity really works, show that, and, and that it works better when we do it this way. Scientifically, we know uh, diversity makes us richer, makes us smarter, makes us, makes us more creative, so do it. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Nabiko. Someone else, what are, what are we charged with at this moment? I'll just add very quickly, oops, am I on? Oh, I am. That um, I really believe that um, we're gonna all have the correct answers because we're going to need multiple strategies um, in the same way that NIDIC has taught us, there is no one way or one path. Um, my personal professional strategy is to continue to focus on the youth. And because we did see in the voting numbers that this generation for all the fun that's made around millennials, all races and ethnicity overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly 70% were voting blue. So, you know, the, the, that, that other folks who are on, 
that's not where I'm putting my energy. My energy is the next generation, who I'm in the room with. But also, I really feel that it is so important for us as artists to help everyone else who is a closeted artist. Because when I go into a kindergarten room, that entire classroom is filled with five-year-old, six-year-old artists. And so I'm adamant about always recognizing that I'm always working with artists. Emerge, they might be emerging, they might be professional, but if we can bring our society to bring the art back into our everyday practice, where our art is both beautiful, expressive, utilitarian, and powerful, um, maybe we create a society where people are builders and not destroyers because it is so easy to destroy and making money in a capitalist society is becoming a top is about becoming a top destroyer is about the climate crisis that we're facing so for me personally I just have my focus on the folks I want to collaborate with the young people and everyone that I meet in the room is an artist and I just got to help them out of the closet because that'll make them happier and that'll make the world a better place. Absolutely, and thank you. And my, my phone, yeah. Um, we have, well, it's 8.20 and um, <laughs> I'm reading the uh, uh, chat. Um, box. Um, just as a way of uh, closing out, or or are we at time for closing out, or do we have time for one last question? Uh, okay. So um, since we started this discussion um, with the lens through the lens of equity, um, what does equity look like in the world that we imagine, in the world that we are trying to build? Carol? I was just saying it looks like Nidic. It looks like going into that room in Nidic everywhere. Not, not just at Nidic, it's everywhere. It's in every school, it's in every um, office, it's in, the, it's in communities, it's in parks. Um, you know, I, I keep saying to people, you don't do diversity. Diversity isn't something that you do, diversity is. Mm -hmm. Anymore, you can't do diversity any more than you can do breathing. <laughs> um, <laughs> because the, the world, is enormously diverse. It was built in at the beginning. That's, you know, that, that's the beauty of it. And if we could just get out of our own way as human beings and understand our place in nature and our relationship to nature and to each other and, and value all of those, those voices and um, um, ways of being and uh, um, people in, in this world, and understand we all need the same thing. There's some basics that we need. We need food, clothing, shelter. When all that stuff is taken care of, you still need to make songs, you still need to dance, you still need to sing, you still need to tell stories. And be, making that available to everybody, everywhere, all of them as valued as anybody else's so that we're no longer fighting over a room in the master's house. Amen and hallelujah. Um, <laughs> I think I think it's also um, you know like um, being true to our authentic selves. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I don't have to be like somebody else, or I don't have to do it this way. I can do it the way you know, like. Um, so I just gave an example. You know, like even talking sometimes is circular, right? So like when I begin to tell a story, I might tell you up front, like sort of what the moral of that story is. And then I might go all the way around here and then come back and which is very different, right? Than um, Western theater where uh, you start up, you have the arc and then you, you know, but that, that's, not, that's not me. That's not how I tell a story. And that's not how I grew up hearing stories told. So I think it's equity is also being true to our authentic selves. Absolutely. You know, and, and um, in our communities, very, very few of us get to interact in other communities 
very few of us get to interact in the world. Um, I'm remembering two, two experiences in the International Women's Playwrights Conference. Um, one was we were in a gigantic circle in Australia and all women, well, 95% of the circle was women. Um, indigenous women from Australia, uh, black women from US and the Caribbean, uh, mostly white women from Europe and the US. And the conversation was about where the next festival was going to be. And the, the Caribbean women and African women were saying, and this is the language, we don't want to see this conference in another white country. Well, there was this silence that came over the room, particularly with the indigenous women. And I kind of being uh, aware of the vibe, I, I said, there's something that's happening in the room that's not being spoken to. And the indigenous women from Australia said, this is not a white country. And the women of color from the Caribbean and whatnot said, well, that's not what we meant. But again, it, is a, it was a clash that would not have been even understood had it not been pointed out. And it was about indigenous people and land. And way back then, that was not a conversation that was going on in communities of color. So that ins insensitivity really halted the whole meeting. And it, it wasn't vicious, it wasn't intention, it was simply lack of knowledge. And I think one of the things that, that is tackled in the Institute is when there is lack of knowledge, we have been able to unpack it and to try and uh, understand it. So um, that's what I think uh, one of our roles is to unpack and understand uh, one another. So we are now at 826 and I think, I think we're, I think they're telling me Yes, um, they're, they're saying that we need to move to closing. So I just will ask each of you, is there anything that you needed to say tonight um, that you feel that you can say quickly uh, and, and, and just, you know, drop the mic? So I'm going to ask each of you just to, to kind of... Uh, make a closing comment, but briefly. Sharon, you want to begin? You're, you're, you're already on the big screen. Um, well, I, I, you know, it's a very rich conversation and I, I, um, I think, um, you know, we just need to go out and do our work and do it the best way we can. And, um, and, and, and we need to put some new words out, out into the universe, I think, too. Thank you. Thank you. Adelina? Uh, I want to take a moment to ask everyone to um, remember what it's like to hold Nidic in your hearts long after we've departed and to remember that we have come together virtually in a time where there is great loss in the world. And so that if we can leave this panel remembering um, the importance of rituals that we've learned, um, because there are a lot of souls that have not had their proper um, coming home to. And I think that this is a powerful group and that we can collectively uh, do that work until we can all gather safely. And I just want everyone to be safe so that I can see you all in the flesh down the road. Please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Carol, really, really quickly. <laughs> I'm just going to say I was just so grateful to be on this panel with you all. I'm just so 
um, I wish I could be in the room with everybody, wish you could all be in space together so that we could hold each other. But absent that, I'm just going to say that the love that I have for all of you runs real deep and very in true. Thank you, thank you, ditto. Um, Nobuko? Well, thank Quick. you. Thank you, Rumi, for being a great uh, uh, host for us. And uh, I call you Rumi because not are you am I, but are o o o am I, <laughs> uh, my roommate and uh, my, my uh, soulmate. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, uh, for what you've given me and for everybody uh, who shared in this conversation. Uh, it's, uh, I'm very grateful to be in your presence, even if it is a circle of squares. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, oh, you are my woman tours. And I learned so, so very much from you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I do believe that we have to close out now. Oh, yeah. Because it's 830. Hi, um, hi Linda. Um, sometimes spaces like uh, this, sometimes spaces like this, rooms like this, need to be just honored by reverence and just silence. Rich conversations happen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Nobuko. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Carol. Your work has really paved uh, for the path for us. We stand on your shoulders. This struggle has continued and you're still in the struggle. And I know, Adelina, you are young in age, <laughs> but way, way, way old in consciousness, in your craft and the amount you give um, to us, to every room that you're in. Um, we are so grateful for your contribution, all of you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, gratitudes uh, to our tech team, uh, Tanya, Suzanne, Kayla, Emily, and many others I'm not naming maybe who are holding this and making this happen. Um, I'm so grateful to, for your work. Um, please join us tomorrow uh, for a, a brilliant movement class by a, a workshop by a brilliant artist whom I deeply love and respect, Dora Ariola. Um, and I want to thank um, the, all the funders who have supported us over the years, and especially this year, Mellon and Doris Duke. Be safe and good night. Good night.
that I was still on.